Hello there, so I finally finished reading The Dinosaur Lords, the whole series, and I mean, the name kind of says it all. This is a book about knights that ride dinosaurs in battle and live in a world full of dinosaurs and stuff, and I think it's great. However, you know from that description whether or not you're going to like it, I think. Like, if you hear that and you think that sounds stupid, you're not going to like these books. If you hear it and think that it sounds amazing, then you probably will like them. If you're a little more on the fence, though, then maybe keep watching and I might change your mind. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, this is basically just an epic fantasy, but it also has dinosaurs in it. Uh, you know, it starts off with a big battle that ends off a war. Uh, one of the losers from that battle, who is thought to be dead, uh, winds up getting roped in to this place called Providence uh, because the people there are considered heretics by most of the rest of this empire. And so he, his name's Kirill, by the way. He's probably the closest thing to a protagonist this series has. And they just ask Kirill, hey, you're a very good military strategist and tactician. Uh, we need you to help us train up an army so that we can defend ourselves from all these marauding bandits and uh, armies and such that are coming in to kill us. And Kirill agrees to do it. And meanwhile, while all this is going on, there is some supernatural stuff happening in the background. And uh, a lot of people are worried about something called a Grey Angel Crusade going on, where angels, well, Grey Angels specifically, will come down and start a war which kills uh, many, many people. Now, overall, I want to reiterate, this is a great series, okay? It's a fun, it has a fun premise, uh, it's a really good story. The character cast is great, the world is very well realized, the villains are terrifying, like it's just, it's a very good uh, story that's been put together. The only thing that I wish I knew before going into this is that there is no ending. Because you see, I, I read three books, and there were supposed to be three more, however the author unfortunately died before he could uh, finish it, and so I didn't know that until I was near the end of the final book, so... Uh, the ending is a bit unsatisfying because it's not really meant to be an ending. So while I did overall enjoy my time that I spent here, if you're going to read it, you should know that there will be some unanswered questions by the end of it. I, I'd still say it's worth the, the journey going through there, but we're never really going to find out what happens to all these characters. We're not going to find out the fate of this world, and there's still some questions about like the nature of this world, which we're just, we're just not going to get the answers to. So like I said, this opens on a big battle, which I normally would not be a fan of because you're basically taking a bunch of characters that we don't know and having them fight over stuff we don't necessarily understand. So I would normally not suggest starting off with that, but in this case it works pretty well because it does a good job of introducing us to these characters, it does a good job of introducing us to the, the divisions that exist in this world and uh, this empire, Nueva Europa, where most of the story takes place. Uh, it does a good job of introducing us to that place and how its politics works, and it go does a good job of introducing rivalries between characters and showing off uh, dinosaurs because they are very well um, integrated into human society here, both in like just regular times and in times of war, but there's also wild ones out there, and it's just things like that. You know, it, it does a very good job of introducing us to this story, so I didn't mind too much, and it was a fun battle. That said, after the opener, it slows down quite a bit. Because Kirill, uh, like I said, he gets brought into Providence, but he gets brought in by another character named Rob, who, and the two of them are just traveling for a while, and I wasn't super into that, and then once they first get to Providence and start training up their army, that's also a little slow. And meanwhile, uh, we also are following the Emperor's daughter, Melodia, Princess Melodia, while she is at the Imperial Palace and she's following like a lot of internal politics and stuff, which I just didn't care about that much. So it, while this section of the book isn't bad, it does slow down quite a bit and, bit and it just didn't grab me as much. But then around two thirds to three quarters of the way through the first book, it picks up again and it stays that way throughout uh, the entire rest of the series. So I was not too upset. And even when the story is slow, I really didn't mind because Kirill and Rob are both good characters and watching them get to know each other and develop a friendship is really, really nice. See, they seem almost like they should hate each other because they're actually on opposite sides of the ward where this book starts off, uh, but they don't. Like, they both realize that 
they are both good people, and they both have a mutual love of dinosaurs, and a mutual dislike of a lot of the Nueva Ropan nobility, and so they just respect each other and they get along really well. And, you know, again, they're just, they're both decent people in a world largely filled with bastards, so it's just nice to watch them get to know each other and get to like each other. And uh, even when there are some uh, conflicts between the two of them, things work out okay. And they are good characters individually, too, or great characters individually, I would say, because Kirill is very, very interesting. He's a noble who many years ago was uh, thrown off, uh, thrown out of his position. He's a count, specifically. And so he spent years and years just traveling around, learning how to fight, gathering up followers and stuff. And during this time, he became, as the book describes it, a, a master of all levels of combat, like from individual fighting to small unit tactics to leading armies and having grand campaigns and stuff. Like, he's just a master at all of it, uh, which is very satisfying to watch because, you know, he's clearly very smart and knows what he's doing. Uh, but he also just, in this backstory, he gained all of that on his own, and then he eventually went back and took his throne back, but along the way a whole bunch of people died, and once he got into power he just stopped and wondered, well, what was even the point of all that? Why did I do it? And that just kind of broke him mentally, and so now he's just searching for a purpose in life because he's thinking, well, there, there has to have been a reason why all those people died for me, and that makes him just a very interesting character. You know, he's not like a young chosen one like in most fantasy series. He's like in his 40s, but he has this whole long backstory which contributes to his character while still, his story is still being told, basically. Like he's in the middle of all the cool stuff he gets to do, and I really liked that. And as for Rob Corrigan, he's also pretty interesting. He's a lot simpler than Kirill, I will say that, but he's just a very fun character. You know, he's a bard, he's a rogue, scoundrel, however you want to call him, uh, he, and he's a dinosaur master, so he knows how to do all this stuff, but he's not as uh, perfect as Kirill. He's just really good at a couple of things, and I don't know, he's just fun to watch. I liked him. And as for most of the other characters in these books, uh, they start off a little weaker, like I wasn't into them, but over time, most of them do grow and develop and change and become more interesting. Yeah, not necessarily better people, but more interesting. Like, Princess Melodia starts off as, you know, just kind of a, a princess who thinks she's smarter than she really is, and I just wasn't into her. Uh, but over the course of the story, she learns some lessons, some very painful lessons. Uh, she grows smarter, she gets a little bit harder and tougher as a person. And uh, without going into detail, there is a sequence, or not a sequence, but there is a subplot about how she has to gain the respect of this group of people, and as she's doing it, she is gaining the respect, not because she's a princess, but on her own merits, and as they are gaining, uh, as she's gaining their respect, she was also kind of gaining mine as a reader, or listener technically, because I listen to these au as audiobooks, so it worked really well uh, as parallel meta-narrative, meta would that be the term for it? I don't know, whatever. But uh, then there's also the Emperor Felipe, who at first seems like kind of an idiot, but as time goes on, you realize, okay, he's not stupid, he just has one or two blind spots, but outside of those, he's actually a competent leader, so, like, you know, he, he grows a little bit as a character. And then there's Duke Falk, who is actually one of the people that betrays Kirill at the very beginning of the first book and tries to kill him, and at first, Falk seems like, you know, a, a greedy, power-hungry traitor, uh, but at the same time, he seems pretty cool because he is one of the greatest knights in Nueva Europa, and he rides into battle on the back of an albino T-Rex, which is just cool on the surface, but it's even cooler when you remember that riding meat-eating dinosaurs is extraordinarily rare in this world, and T-Rexes especially because they just don't live in Nueva Europa. Um, but as the story goes on, you learn that he's not just treacherous, he's straight up evil. Like, this dude's an actual rapist, and, like, he's an awful person. But at the same time, he does do some good. You know, he does help save the Emperor, and it's pretty clear that the good guys would not have been able to win in an important battle in one of the other books if it weren't for Duke Falk. So, what I'm saying is, he rapes, but he saves. And so on and so forth. Basically, every character that gets even a little bit of screen time in this book, or in the series, 
grows and develops and changes a little bit from what they were when you first find them, and that's very impressive and difficult to do, so kudos to that. The setting for the series I did overall like, but it is kind of weird. So the main empire is Nueva Europa, and that's basically just the Holy Roman Empire, but it's more multi-ethnic. You know, like the Holy Roman Empire in real life was primarily German, but this has like other ethnic groups in there. And you know, it's like a decentralized feudal monarchy where the emperor is actually elected to their position. Uh, but they always are elected from the same family, and then there's also dinosaurs mixed in there. However, the author got really lazy with the cultures here, uh, both inside of Nueva Europa and outside of it. Like, he just took real-world cultures, tweaked the names slightly, and then left it at that. Like, uh, the main kingdom that makes up the Nueva Europa Empire is España, which is very obviously Spain. You know, the people there speak Spanish, and uh, their names are Spanish, and so on and so forth. But then the other kingdoms are like Catalonia, and Francia, and Alemania, and Slavia, and it's just like, man, come on. I don't like that, you know? And then you go outside of um, New Wave Europa, and they do the same thing. Like, they have uh, Turco peoples, and uh, Italianos, which are Italians, and uh, Airlandish, and, um, oh crap, I forget what they're called. I think, I want to say Rome, but they're just Roma. You know, it's just... It's, um, it, it, it's lazy. I don't like when fantasy series do that. It just, it, when you're just copy-pasting real world, world cultures. I would rather, if they're going to do that, just have Nueva Europa be just Spania, you know, and just basically be Spain. That way I'm just annoyed by it once rather than repeatedly. There's very little magic in this setting, like it is low fantasy, but it doesn't really feel like low fantasy because, well, one, we do see magic at a couple of points, like, uh, Kirill gets his hand bitten off right at the beginning, and then very early on he gets it grown back with magic, and he's like, whoa, this is crazy. Uh, and then also there's dinosaurs around, so you know, it, it feels like a fantastical world. Like, I, I've been planning a video on low fantasy for a little while, I don't know when that'll ever come about, but uh, basically I just don't see the point of it a lot of the time because, like, the whole point of fantasy is to be transported to a weird fantastical world where there's like magic and elves and shit and so if you're going to have a world with none of that well what's what's even the point but in this case it avoids that because there are dinosaurs and there is a weird kind of sci-fi twist about this world i don't know if twist is the right word uh because none of the characters in the books ever actually acknowledge this and as far as I can tell, none of them know about it. It's actually just something that I've put together based on some very heavy clues earlier on in the story. But, uh, so this isn't a spoiler. I, I will have a spoiler corner where I bring up some, like, theories about this, but basically th this isn't a spoiler. So it's very heavily implied that this pl planet they're on, Paradise, is actually a planet that was colonized by humans many thousands of years in the future, or hundreds of years, whatever, in the future at some point. And that raises some questions. Like, I, I figured this out because there are notes and stuff about this where it says that um, the people here believe that they were originally from another world called Home, and then they were brought to paradise by the creators, along with a couple of animals like horses and goats and stuff, but all the animals that already lived there were, you know, dinosaurs. And uh, it's mentioned that home would have felt like a strange world to them because they would feel heavier there and the years were 1.6 times as long and the air was thinner and it's colder. And when I heard that, I realized like, oh, okay, it's just another planet. And at first I was nervous about that because I've seen perfectly good fantasy stories kind of wreck themselves at the end by putting in big sci-fi twists like a there's a couple of anime that have done it, like uh, Scrapped Princess is one, and uh, Uchawari Rumono is another one, where like, they're perfectly good fantasy stories, but then they just decide near the end, hey, let's tell everyone it was sci-fi the whole time, you know, all this magic was actually technology the whole time, and I don't know, it didn't work well. But in this case, um, I thought about it for a bit, and I was like, well, at least here it's like foreshadowed, it's very heavily foreshadowed, so when it happens it won't take me by surprise and take me out of the story, so that's good. Really it would depend on how this is uh, brought up later in the story, like 
when the characters in the last book or whatever finally come to terms with the the nature of their world like how does that that how is that revealed and what does that lead to that would really be the term determining factor in whether or not i think this is a good idea or not and like i said we never got a proper ending so uh i guess it's kind of a moot point uh that said it brings up a lot of questions about the nature of this world like okay obviously the magic they're seeing is just very advanced technology but how exactly is that technology working uh, what is the point of the Grey Angels? Why were they created? Uh, what are the Fae precisely? Why does no one here know about the fact that they come from another planet exactly? Uh, why is their technology level so low? You know, all that sort of thing. And unfortunately, we'll never get answers to those questions, but it is raised when you give a setup like this. I do want to point out that the battles and climaxes in these books are just fucking phenomenal. Like, all, all three books end on a big battle and all of them are fantastic. Like, I just don't have a lot else to add there. I think the smaller scale fights, like, between individuals and stuff are kind of weird because the author just gets a little mechanical when he writes about them. You know, it's like, he twisted his hips counterclockwise and threw half of his weight into the other man, which caused him to lose his balance and then hit the floor. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's a little too play-by-play. -play. Uh, but the actual battles where it's just describing it on a grander scale works fantastic. And the battle at the end of the second book, The Dinosaur Knights, is one of the best I've read in epic fantasy. Like, this, this is a genre that is full of big epic battles, and that is one of the greatest. It, it is fantastic. Like, I, I wouldn't call it exactly on par with the last battle, because that's just the best ever, uh, but it is easily on par with, like, the Battle of the Tower from The Way of Kings, or the Battle of Garriston from The End of the Black Prism. Just phenomenal battle with like some back and forth and the heroes are fighting against enemies who are magical and they don't totally understand them but they have to try otherwise very bad things will happen to all of them it's just it's just great and i don't have a lot else to add there uh the only one last complaint i will throw in about the series is that the prose itself is not always good i mean i mentioned that it's not good in the battles sometimes but there's sometimes just weird lines, which, um, I don't, I don't like them. You know, you know, it's just a, not a good way of describing things, either because they have weird run-on sentences or just ones that describe things in a weird way, which maybe was intended to be funny, but it just comes across as either confusing or cringy. So, I don't know, it's, it didn't, it wasn't a deal breaker for me, but overall, uh, before I go into the spoilers, I just want to say again, The Dinosaur Lords was a very fun series. I would recommend it to most people, but again, you do have to keep in mind that there, there is no proper ending here. Like, I still think it was worth the time because I loved reading it, and I think if you are any sort of writer yourself, this should inspire you, but uh, you, just, you should know that going in and know that you're just not going to get a, answers to all the questions that you have, but... That's up to you to decide, and uh, that's about it, so spoiler corner time, let's go. Alan. So first, real quick theory about uh, how this world is the way it is. Uh, my theory is that Earth, for whatever reason, just became uninhabitable. You know, some combination of overpopulation and pollution, possibly nuclear war or something, just made it so that human life there was no longer sustainable, so the few survivors left had to go to paradise, and maybe it was already terraformed or in the process of being terraformed, maybe they had to fix it themselves, but whatever the case, they had to go there, and um, they started living there. Uh, but because habitable planets are just so rare in the universe, they had to try and come up with a way to make sure that they didn't destroy this one the way they did Earth, and eventually what they decided on was that, okay, we should get rid of most of our technology, uh, so that no one is able to destroy things too badly again. And we should also make sure that no one knows about that technology so they don't try to use it or create it again. And in order to prevent us from progressing or growing too populated or something, they decided to create the Grey Angels, which just uh, occasionally they will go in and kill a bunch of humans. And humans think it's for like religious purposes, but in actuality it's for to keep the balance of paradise, as they call it. And there's two different factions of angels. There's the ones that just want to kill most of humanity and the ones that want to completely purge all of them. And um, 
I, I feel like the ones who decided to purge all of humanity are like malfunctioning AIs or something, but I'm not totally sure. It is a little confusing, and I also don't know exactly how the Fae would fit into this theory. Uh, I think they might just straight up be aliens who lived there beforehand, because they mentioned they lived there before humans, but uh, that raises other questions, so... I, I, I just don't know for certain, but I wanted to get that out there. And as for, like, actual criticisms of uh, the books that go into spoilers, they're pretty much all about Duke Falk. So, first of all, I have to talk about him sexually assaulting Melodia at the end of the first book, and uh, I think at first that's handled really well. Like, at first, it is obviously a very terrible, traumatizing thing that he does, and as you're reading it, you just feel kind of gross and helpless, and uh, you see as time goes on how badly it affects Melodia, and how it doesn't completely break her as a person, uh, but it does traumatize her quite a bit and give her a lot to deal with as the story goes on. So I think in that sense it is handled very well. But then there's other times where it's really, really not. Like, for instance, there's just points where it seems like the author's trying to make it almost comedic. And like, okay, I'm not saying you can't do that, like you can't have dark comedy or something, but it, with something like this, you either have to treat it as one or the other. You know, you, you have to treat it basically as, okay, it's a really horrible thing, let's deal with that, or just try and make it funny, which I, I think you can joke about pretty much anything if you do it right. Like, you may think it's in bad taste or something, but it's possible to do. But then, at the same time, it's just constantly mentioning how he <laughs> her in the ass, specifically, which, like, wh why? What difference does that make? I Maybe it's a little more painful, but I just, I, I don't know, okay? And then there's one specific line where it was saying how she remembered it and how it felt like a flaming hot turd going in and out of her bowels. Like, just, dude, what the fuck? Like, the the editor should have gotten to that and, and just crossed that line out and written no on the manuscript, but I don't know. It just, it does not work when you try to be both comedic and dark. And I'm not even certain he was trying to be comedic here, but it just, I... There's multiple lines here that just left me sitting there wondering, what the fuck are you doing, man? And then, of course, uh, again, Duke Falk. He should have died at the end of the third book, uh, because, long story short, Kirill and Rob uh, have to flee the Imperial Palace while they're there, uh, because the, some people try to kill them, and then it seems like maybe they were trying to kill the Emperor. And so, the two of them, along with uh, Kirill's pet Allosaurus named Shira, who, Shira's a good girl, by the way. Like, she, she was just, she's like a big puppy, and it made me so happy whenever good things happened to her, because she, she was just so sad and lonely for most of the first two books before she got to find Kirill again, and I was just, I was just so happy when she found him. But, uh, anyways, remember, Duke Falk and his albino T-Rex, Snowflakes, Snowflake, uh, were the ones who betrayed them and nearly killed both of them at the beginning of the book, so... Kirill and Shira both have reason to hate them, and when they get into a fight uh, at the end of the final book, it, which I know was not intended to be the final book, but uh, they win the fight. Like, Kirill stabs Falk through the mouth, and he, it specifically mentions that he could have just punched his sword through the back of his head and instantly killed him, but he just pulls back because, uh, I don't know, why not? And then Shira manages to get a death bite on Snowflake, and... It's clear that she would have been able to kill him if uh, they had kept going with it, but instead they get surrounded and Kirill just tells her, hey, come on, let's run. So that one at least makes a little more sense. But just from a narrative standpoint, Falk and Snowflake should have died there because even if this is not intended to be a climax, it just renders them less effective as villains if the heroes defeat them and then they come back. You know, because I mentioned in a video a few months ago that... Fundamentally, villains have to operate as obstacles for the heroes to overcome. You know, they have to be a threat to them reaching their goals. And for most of the series, Falk and Snowflake work really well for that, because it's made very clear that there are very few people in this world who pose a physical threat to Kirill. Like, he's just too good at what he does. But Duke Falk is one of those people. And 
you know, again, we see at the beginning, even if it was a surprise attack, he did defeat him. And so when it's more of a closer to a straight-up fight here and Kirill and Sheral win, then that's when we know, like, okay, Falk and Snowflake can beat them. And so they're just they're just not as threatening after that. Like, if you do that too much, then they just become like Team Rocket, where they come back in every episode and the heroes defeat them in a slightly different way every time, and it just... it just doesn't work. And, uh, again, I know this wasn't supposed to be a climax, but it would have made for a more satisfying conclusion here if those two were dead, but now it's just one more thread that's left hanging. Uh, so... Yeah, that was just very disappointing, and the ending, while again, it wouldn't have been very good to begin with, it ends on a cliffhanger, that just made it even worse to me. So, I felt the need to bring it up, but, I don't know, again, The Dinosaur Lords is very, very good, I think it's worth checking out, so if you came this far, give it a shot, uh, but whatever you decide, I'll see you later. Goodbye. Hello, and thank you for watching this far. If you did, you have my thanks. And if you see all these names here, those are my patrons. My $10 and up patrons are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Anselievich, Dark King, Echo, Flax, Great Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Marilyn Roxy, Matthew Baudreau, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Tesla Shark, Vavixis, and Wesley. All of you are great. If you want to get your name up here, then consider becoming a patron. If you can't do that, then you could also become a YouTube channel member, or just like the video, comment, and subscribe to share it around, and uh, help me eat food this month. Uh, yeah, thanks. Goodbye.